Well, welcome everybody. This is our second deep dive webinar. Uh, this time we got Ramiz Kent here. Um, hey, Ramiz, how you doing this morning, Ramiz? I'm I'm good. It's it's. Uh, I know you're in the evening. Well, right? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 seven it's seven p.m. here in in the UK, and um, thankfully the sun's out. Actually, where I'm looking right now, there's it's hardly a cloud in the sky, which is quite um, unusual. Yeah, it looks like it's looks like it's just as sunny there for you, except you're on the other end of the deal. Yeah, indeed, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Cool. <laughs> well, last time we uh, we had John Lu on, and we got some more of the context for the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Foundation, and and how all kind of that got started. And I know you're deeply involved with that. Uh, you're the currently the advisor for the restoration happening on the camp, and I know we'll get into that, some of that. Um, but you know, you also have a, a history as a designer and as a consultant, as a, a teacher uh, through the permaculture approach, um, and that, that story has also woven with the origin of the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Foundation. So, maybe to get into it all, let's let's can you introduce yourself and some of that history, and uh, I'm sure that'll dive us into a lot of that. Yeah. So, um, first of all. Good evening, everybody, or good morning, wherever you happen to be. Uh, my name's my name's Ramiz Kent. Uh, I am um, I'm I'm currently serve uh, on the uh, supervisory board for the Ecosystem Restoration Camp uh, Foundation, um, and I, I also serve as a uh, co-director of the Permaculture Research Institute, both the uh, Australian branch and also of uh, uh, PRI USA. Um, and uh, I, I also am the uh, founder and director of a, of a business that I've um, started in the UK. I've registered in the UK with a UK company's house called Agroecological Natural Technology Systems or ANTS um, uh, Limited. So uh, I've been involved in uh, doing this, uh, this work, this uh, permaculture design or regenerative design work, however, um, whatever moniker you want to use, uh, since 2009. Um, I have uh, my my formal educational background is is in catering, um, which I got my degree now uh, twenty three years ago, which is quite frightening. Uh, and I I worked um, mostly with um, sort of medical uh, devices. I did R and D work. Um, one of my my first job out of college was was with uh, Dean Kamen. Uh, the guy who invented uh, the Segway. <laughs> um, I actually I used to work for him while that was still kind of like a, a Skunk Works project um, many moons ago. Um, and uh, you know I've, I've, I've been able to take my experience from uh, you know some of my engineering, my past engineering work, and interest in life sciences, biology, ecology, and and combine them uh, in in this capacity. And um, it's been it's been um, it's been really interesting. It's been fascinating. Uh, it's uh, you're always learning something. You're always meeting great people, going to interesting places, eating good food, <laughs> um, and uh, and I think that you know the ERC in many ways um, is is an attempt to try to uh, make that available to a, to a wider. Uh, variety of people, a wider population of people that have a similar interest, but maybe not have uh, an opportunity to, to be able to um, actually be in a place where you act, you have a project that is running in addition to, um, uh, you know, tr practical uh, uh, trainings and um, capacity building and, no and, and knowledge and skill building um, sort of all in, in one location, and especially in a place that uh, has uh, many features of the of the types of, of problems that you're likely to run into, uh, especially when 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 uh, hoping to uh, improve this this problem of land degradation and desertification that we're seeing in, in um, ever growing parts of the globe. Mm -hmm. So um, that's uh, that's me in a nutshell, more or less. The, 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 there's more to tell, but um, we'll see if. That 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 sort of spills out as we get further into it. Well, let's spill. So this is a deep dive. So let's spill some of it out. So, <laughs> yeah. So how'd you get into this? And then also, how did 
you know, I know your career with the PRI and everything, and then with Jeff Lawton, and that all kind of overlapped with, you know, how you met John Liu and how all this. Yeah. Why don't we dive into some of that and we get a little more of the context? This flesh, because you have your own angle on how all this kind of began, and it's interwoven with a lot of things, you know? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I met Jeff, the first time I met Jeff was in 2008. And I was still living in the San Francisco Bay Area at the time. And um, funnily enough, I was, work, I was working um, as an administrator for um, an Arabic language program that was being held on the campus of UC Berkeley that was being run by um, some, some friends of mine. And uh, in the course of uh, helping to run sort of some of the logistics um, of, of, of that that, that class, um, I met uh, a, a, a woman who was a, who was a student in the course who used to work for Jeff and Nadia um, in Australia, and she uh, she was the person who actually introduced me to um, permaculture. I had no idea what it was, and um, and she's like, "You don't know about permaculture?" I'm like, "No, what the heck is that?" <laughs> I and think it's everyone's she, first introduction to it, right? You don't like, know about <laughs> what the heck is that? I was like. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not knowing. And she, uh, she showed me the, uh, the, the original Greening the Desert video, which um, I, I'm, I can't remember when that, that first video was made. It's basically that stop animation video and Jeff is narrating over it. Um, so, I, so this is the first site that was in the, in the Jordan Valley. And I remember seeing it and immediately it just pressed all my buttons, you know, in, the, in a, in a, the best sense of the term. And, uh, and I, I just remember just thinking to myself, I have to, I have to do that. Yeah. And I, coincidentally, he was, uh, uh, Jeff was coming to the Bay Area to do uh, a, a handful of classes and workshops uh, at a place called, well, the, pla the, the place he was coming to in the Bay um, uh, on the date that we were gonna go up and see him was uh, Solstice Hope in Nicasio, which is, it's in Marin County. So um, we got a group of, of, of some of the students that were in the course and we went to go visit. Um, and Nadia was, was on the trip as well. And in meeting him, in meeting Jeff, I, I came to find out that he knew an old friend of mine. And that sort of cemented for me, um, you know, my, my intention to go down and, and see what I could learn from him. So, you know, I, I told him, hey, I wanna, I wanna, I'd like to, you know, see about, if I could study with you, come down and, and study with you. And he said, yeah, just come, just, you know, just come on down. And so this was at his, at his farm, Zaytuna farm in the Shannon in uh, Northeast New South Wales, about 45 minutes inland from uh, Byron Bay. Mm -hmm. So um, I spent three months uh, on the farm took about four or five classes. He taught like, he had taught this whole string of courses back to back to back to back to back. And then uh, he, and this is also in kind of the, the early days of what's now the internship uh, program that he, that he has established. So this was kind of before it really was kind of a super organized codified thing. So I had a chance to do that. I, I, I jumped in on a couple of, uh, of consultancies, uh, one of them being, um, Mazdar City in Abu Dhabi, which funnily enough, I had, I had been interested in probably about two or three years earlier when I first heard about the project. Um, I think it was 06 was the first time it, it had actually been, you know, kind of publicly um, talked about. So um, that, that just opened my eyes to uh, a number of possibilities for applying, you know, the, whole, the permaculture work um, specifically um, to the issue of, of land degradation and desertification. I mean, actually, that came that came a little later on, mm -hmm. um, and and th and that is where the connection eventually to to John Liu um, uh, came together. So I I had met um, someone who was working for UK Diffid, um, and he wasn't able. So we we had collaborated on on um, on some work. Uh, and trying to put some information together to get to, to, to make the case for funding a project specifically. There was a project in Pakistan, in the flood zones of Pakistan, 
in Sin, the province. So they had big floods there in like 2010 or 2011. So we were able to, you know, make a case to get a project funded. I was able to find a couple of people to get, um, to manage that project. And then uh, I had, in his stead, in his place, I had been invited to a conference called the Co-Forum uh, for Human Security in Co-Switzerland. And the year that I met John was the first year they had put together uh, a program specifically looking at the problem of land degradation and linking that to human security. Right. So it's called the Co Co Forum Dialogue on Land and Security. That's C A U A X or K? Yes, C U C A U X Co. So French, you know, Swiss French. So it's a it's a it's a small mountain village just above Montreux overlooking Lake Geneva. It's a beautiful place. And, and, and there's some, you know, some really great people I've had a chance to meet at that, um, at that event. And, and so John is one of those people. Yeah. And um, so that was uh, the summer of 2011. Mm-hmm. And it was there that we had, um, I had, I had told him about needing to introducing him to Jeff, Jeff Lawton. Uh, so I had, I had seen John's films, uh, I think it was Hoping to Change in Climate and, and Lessons from the Los Plateau. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then I told him, look, you need to go see my guy, Jeff. And uh, I told him he's going to be in Jordan in the fall. And uh, it would be good if you could get together and maybe talk to him uh, about some of the work that he's doing. So he had a chance to go uh, to meet up with him in Jordan. And then the the... That experience and some of the film work that he did eventually led to uh, the the making of the of the documentary Green Gold. So Green Gold had premiered on VPRO in in Holland. I think it was April the twelfth, something like that. So uh, uh, that film came from uh, you know partially came from us meeting. And, um, and then he, you know, he said after meeting Jeff, he says, whatever, you know, he said, whatever you guys are doing, I'd like to, I'd like to really, um, you know, collaborate with you or work with you on on whatever it is that that you're involved with. And, um, and then that basically sort of led to, um, trying to crystallize this idea that is now ERC. So he had written, um, he had written a, uh, uh, an article let me see if I can pull it up, uh, that had been published on the uh, Permaculture Research Institute website about the creation of ecological restoration training centers. Right. right so that was, that was probably in 2012. And then eventually in 2015 to 2016, when I was teaching a course in Tuscany, Northern Italy, um, he hap- John happened to be in the neighborhood attending a conference. I told him, why don't you come and spend a, you know, just come visit, maybe spend a couple of days. Um, and, and, you know, in the course of doing this PDC. And uh, that's really started to, to talk about some of the detail. And then eventually, um, so that was, that was spring. That was like, must have been May 2016. Summer 2016, while I was in the States, I had to talk to Alfonso. Mm-hmm. Um, Alfonso uh, Chico de Guzman, is, whose family owns the that, that we now currently have, you know, the first pilot ERC site set up on. Mm-hmm. And um, after talking to Alfonso, that's when it this all pretty much crystallized, and we pulled in, you know, more people that could provide uh, some of the technical particulars that would need to be um, that would need to be on hand in order to really put some meat on the bones, so to speak. And so now, you know, we've, we've, we've got, you know, we've got a formal, um, you know, foundation set up, registered in Holland. Um, you know, we've got people on the ground there, you know, designed together by, you know, by other designers that have been called in, other advisors have been called in. So hopefully, you know, this is, this is allowed for the groundwork to be laid that will have been to something that can be replicated and, and um, set up elsewhere. Yeah, beautiful. Um, I want to tell everybody well, that's out there, I know we got, uh, I see a few names I recognize, uh, Alex and Gabriel, and uh, we got Judas Schwartz here listening. I want to, ah, yeah, Judas, hey. yeah. <laughs> I, I want to let everybody, Scott, hey, how's it going? And um, 
just want to let everybody know who's listening to think of questions. And as you think of them, feel free to put them in the Q and A. And we're good. We want to get set a lot, set aside at least a half hour at the end to get to all your questions. And if need be, I can even unmute your microphone so we can chat with you. Um, but just you guys are, we're all participating in this together. So we're deep diving and you're deep diving with us. So keep, keep your questions coming and, and then let's get a big stockpile of those and, and have a nice session with that at the end. So I want yeah, to Yeah, I, I have to say Ju Ju Judith, Judith is a fellow co-traveler. <laughs> so she was, she was up there, oh, must have been, was it last year? I mean, last year I saw up there. Um, Elizabeth Kucinich, Dennis Kucinich's wife. You know the congressman. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. So uh, yeah, the, yeah, the peace. Ho 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 yeah. ho hopefully, hopefully, governor of Ohio coming up. Um, so yeah, it's it's been yeah. This that that again that that particular event has been really great. We met Alan Savory and his wife Judy. We've met um, uh, folks from uh, you know various UN agencies. Other you know uh, Dylan Fawerta from Common Land, formerly of IUCN. You know, lots of really, really good people, you know, up there. I'm just shout, 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 shout out to the co-forum initiatives of change. Yeah, I got to get out there one of these years. It sounds like a very powerful place. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, re you really do. You really do. It's a good place. Good people. I was just telling uh, someone who had a, a, a interesting bit of input in the chat that feel free to do that too, but also feel free to take your interesting insights or thoughts doesn't even have to be in the form of a question and put it in the Q and A too, so we can consolidate. But either way, it, participation is a great thing. Um, so let's let's get a little bit into what's happening at the camp because I know uh, a lot of folks are really interested in that, and you're kind of the main advisor for what's happening there, and you've been watching the progress. You know what the land was like before. You know what the region was like before. You know what some of the ramifications of a good model site in the region are. Let's get into some of that, you know, like what's what's happening in Spain and and uh, where's it going? Well, I mean, Spain, I think Spain is an interesting, well, southern Spain in particular is a really interesting setting. I mean, historically speaking, um, you know, the area that the project is based in, um, specifically, it's a place called La Juanquera. Um, is uh it's on the altiplano so i i think elevation they're, they're upwards of um uh thousand meters yeah you know a little, or little better more, a little more yeah a little more than a thousand yeah. maybe 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 somewhere closer to 1100 11 or 1200 so yeah. it's it's you know it's it's you know it's up there and it's it's all um it's it, in terms of the climate it's semi-arid so you're looking at rainfall of somewhere between 200 and 250 millimeters a year. Um, 50 is actually, that's a good year. <laughs> you know, that, that's, you know, on average, and we've had some of the, um, the folks on site that have been chasing down some of the data. Uh, you know, they've, they've been able to, to pull up some of the local, uh, the, the local precipitation uh, 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 annual uh, fall. Uh, over the last, I don't know, maybe 20 or 20 years or so, 25 years, and you you'll you won't get, you won't really see many years, you know, if any, over to in recent in recent memory. So um, a, a lot of the, the you know the land there, and and Alf and you did a you know you did a, an interview with Alfonso. Mm -hmm. I think his family. I think his family's had that that property since what 16th century. No, yeah. no, 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 yeah. Well, not that property. So, so. It, th their family has been farming the the region for five hundred years. Five hundred years, yeah. They've they've only had that property since like the eighteen hundreds. So. <laughs> okay, o only, yeah, only, right. Yeah. So you know they they they're basically two families that that own you know pretty large amount you know a lot of land in that area. I mean, roughly. Yeah you know between i think between the two families it's it's upwards of uh you know 30 square kilometer i'm sorry yeah 30 square kilometers yeah huge so, so it's about yeah. it's about you know it's 3000 3000 hectares yeah. and then with their relations know, especially plus. especially through Avalal and and their relations there's i mean there's a whole region full of farmers who are totally yeah who, totally yeah 
so it's it's um you know it's what's it's interesting to see uh you know j just in terms of the 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 long the longevity you know and the continuity and 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 sort of the, the people that have been involved involved with um the the management of landscapes up there you know over the course of the last few hundred years but i mean if you take it back further and i thought this was interesting you know what, what alfonso had said in 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 your interview with him yeah um and this gets into some of the kind of the larger uh historical dynamics of spain um say between the the history of like moorish spain right pre and post moorish spain yeah. now th this is a particular interest to me because i'm you know i've been muslim for all the years right and and i think oh you know, spain as sort of an edge yeah. <laughs> you know between you know between europe and you know what is nominally called the the muslim world well, especially it's that been, region. yeah, because yeah, no, exactly. Even, because even it's, in it's, Spain, you have like the, the the Christian sort of kingdom, and then the Muslim kingdom. We're right. right north and south of this region where this camp is, and so this was it, the no man's yeah. land. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. So it's it's right it's right on the border between um, Murcia and Andalusia. Right. So it's just it's 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 just a really interesting setting. You know, for you know, not only just in terms of the physical, the, the physical characteristics and the and the climatic characteristics, but just historically, um, it's you know, it's really it's really interesting, and it's re and it, I thought it was really telling to um, you know what what Alfonso was saying about what had happened in terms of the land use, yeah. Oh, say po post the you know the the you know the uh, the the pushing out of you know of, of the Moors. Right. From, from those places. So, you know, previously, a, a lot of those regions still had a lot of a lot of the, the tree cover. They had not been completely cleared. It was oaks, oak, um, oak, oak forest. Yeah. Right. It was mostly mostly oaks. You know, it was Quercus of some variety. So, you know, it probably was some variation on no, on, no. The Dehes, on the on the on the Dehesa, um, where you had, you know, some you had the trees probably along with 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 some livestock. Uh, um, whether or not that was, um, you know, that had, been, that had been managed by way of um, being able to affect the movement of either, you know, wild game or you had some sort of domesticated um, livestock. But it was not, it, it had not been used necessarily for the cultivation of, say, cereals, which is what we're yeah. currently dealing with now is the um, sort of the, the, the outcome or the aftermath of this, of this sort of mass of cereals over the course of several decades so right. you know it was mainly oats and, and and barley and and those kinds of things so you know a, a lot of a lot of what we're seeing in terms of the you know the the start starting condition of of the of the landscapes in those areas is just it's just simply a consequence of of that regime of management so most of you know most of the tree cover was removed um, so you go from uh, mostly perennials to the cultivation of annuals, quite a bit of tilling. Um, of course, as, as we've gone further into, you know, over the course of the 20th century, um, the use of heavy equipment. Yeah, I know we've also lot, talked about that. Exactly. Yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of, right. And then the intru intrusive nature of, of how soils are prepared to cultivate those things. Um, I think what's really interesting is I've, I've recently been reading um, uh, a book written by a, a, a really sharp academic named James C. Scott called uh, Against the Grain. And uh, yeah. the subtitle is, is uh, His History of the Early Estates. That's and on he, my list. I haven't gotten to it yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. I mean, it's not big, but I mean, he just hits on so, so many great, um, you know, information in terms of a, a, a more general understanding of, of of how of how history yeah. has unfolded and especially how history has largely been driven by uh, you know by agriculture at least modern history mm -hmm. and and I think this you know and Spain is a great example of that so for example he talks about how um, Asher was was basically a, accomplished 
by uh, through the, the four domestications. So he said the four domestications are plants, plants, animals, fire, and people. And I, and I would think actually possibly a, a, a fifth could be water. Maybe not in that you know, order, you, but yeah, yeah. Maybe not, yeah, not, not necessarily, and, and this isn't, yeah, and this isn't necessarily in, you know, in, in a, uh, in terms of order of like kind of chronological order or logical progression, but it's, there is those, those four things allowed for, if not the establishment of states, the, it allowed for um, human populations to be sedentary. And he and he makes and he makes the delineation between um, the establishment of of civilization, yeah. i.e., you know, a, a state or a polity, and and having groups of people that live in one place for an extended yeah. period of time, and they're not necessarily and they're not necessarily synonymous. And I thought this was a really great insight because you know you read people like Jared Diamond, you know, D D Diamond makes. Um, you know, he says sort of similar things, but there is that bit of, um, you know, sort of a qualification, be, you know, in, in terms of what exactly it, it, it meant for people to be, quote unquote, civilized or to create civilizations. Right. It's more I, than guns, germs and steel. It was, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, 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 I mean, obviously those things are involved. Yeah, in, for sure. In, yeah, I mean, and even with the germs, you know, even with the germs part, the germs part is intimately linked to with agriculture. Yeah. Agriculture, because you know, agriculture brought all of these these components together. That then you know you have this whole other set of biological dynamics that that influences the you know right. the, the the rising up of these you know pathogenic um, uh, these pathogenic ele elements. Right. So it, it you know it's it's you know it, you you could see that stuff. You know. When when you when you arrive in a place like La Junquera, you know at least from the standpoint of you know the agriculture portion, because yeah. you know the point that Scott makes in the book is, and, and the reason why he says that um, it's the that agriculture allowed for the establishment of states is because through the cultivation of of crops that were easy to store, i.e. grains, right, that the state can then levy taxes that allows for the state to actually exist. So it's like fire, cattle, grain, formation <laughs> of states and domestication of humans is kind of one thing, right? Maybe. Right. Well, well so, so actually to that point, this is what, so this is the other interesting part about, about that is, um, and it's funny cause I was just reading about, about this before I got the book is, is the whole, uh, you know, the whole d d uh, debate about whether or not, population drew drew agriculture right right the need like the need to be able to produce enough food to accommodate more dense populations and that was that was thomas malthus right or or it was the ability to be able to manage populations that allowed for the advent of agriculture right. now that's 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 esther Bosra, right. Right? or the, the or the increase of available food gives rise to an increase in population, which is that Malthusian principle too, right? Yeah. Right. But, but, but so, but the thing is, this is, so this is where Scott's insight becomes really valuable is that, you know, he talks, he, you know, he says, look, people weren't exactly chomping at the bit to be held to one piece of land. Right. So, so the only way that agriculture was possible is if you have the labor, like you, you, you need the energy capacity, you need the work, you need the work capacity that actually is, allows for you to be able to cultivate relatively large areas of land. Because if you don't have the work capacity, you can't, you can't, do, the work, you can't do the things necessary to produce a crop. Right. And, and especially with the types of crops that, that were being relied upon, we required more close care from people in order to actually produce, that again, none of this is possible. And, and, and with the further domestication of the varieties that we now, you know, are kind of assumed to be, um, you know, the, the, the bulk of our, our foodstuffs, um, yeah, there, there's no way you could have the numbers of people that we have. And so now, obviously, at this point in history, you know, you go from relying on human labor to, to mechanized labor, you know, with the advent of, you know, being able to convert, you know, the energy capacity of you know, fuels, fossil fuels into mechanical work, right. then that allows for you to be able to do more work with less people. Right. 
which, which and that's easier to manage if if you can you know if you get access to the capital the yeah. financial capital that allows you to get access to the equipment now this yeah. is like this, you know, so this is the stuff that i often sit around thinking about in my kind of engineering mind right and more and more <laughs> I mean, people more and also part of the engineering situation is we have more and more people, or not engineering, but the situation, we have more and more people with time on their hands, you know, and that's, right. and that, and that's either a good or a bad thing, right? It's, uh, no, well, that's, yeah. well, that's exactly it. I mean, because, I mean, I mean you, you then get to the, you know, to the problem of, okay, well, how do you manage, you know, these growing populations of sedentary people? Or how do they... Right. Collaborate or yeah, however you phrase or, or it. How, or how, you know, d depend, you know, whatever it is that you have in mind to do. Yeah. yeah. So this is, you know, this is where, you know, you, you start getting into the, you know, the, the chronic problems of human history. Right. Is that they are, they are a consequence of, you know, one's ability to be able to, number one, marshal the, the labor capacity that allows for the type of work that is done on land that that creates the kind of wealth that ends up being funneled to a smaller and smaller and smaller sliver of the population right and then idea. again and, and then understanding that people don't willingly give themselves over to that kind so you got to figure out ways to manage an uh, ever-growing uh population well that at this point in history you don't necessarily need anymore because you have other ways of being able to get the labor necessary to do the work that creates the wealth. So now you have like X population, you know? So, so, I mean, it's just, you can, I think being able to look at, at, at history and also current events through that lens, right. Uh, just simply certain things as a, as a kind of a mechanical or functional um, reality. Um, they're just certain things that have to be faced, right. and 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 if you're not and if you don't know those things, then you be, you can become really confused rather quickly. Right. But if you understand kind of the the nuts and bolts and the odds of, and ends of of what you kind of have to have in order to produce the current world that you live in, um, mm -hmm. then it becomes a lot more clear, and yeah. then you can kind of anticipate the types of problems that you're likely to run into. Mm -hmm. And so this is, so I think this is very much at the heart of what you see um, at the La Juanquera site is that the, the type of degradation that you see on, you know, on that property is just emblematic of those historical dynamics. So, you know, if you go to, if you go to Jared Diamond's, um, you know, work, and let me see if I can, I'm going to pull up my first slide if that's okay. Do it, man. <laughs> do it. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> So if you, if you go, you know, if you go to, to, you know, to Jared Diamond's work, which I think is, you know, it's, that's, that's a pretty good place to, you know, to start off. Um, you know, he, he looks at the, the major, uh, the, 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 the most common modes of failure for human civilization. And what's interesting about those modes of failure is that they're all tied to um, something connected to the the mismanagement of land, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, it's you know, and 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 this is pretty much spanning, you know, the you know the the vast majority of of human history. Let me see if I can do this really quick. Oh, here we go. Sorry. And let me know if this uh, cool. if this works. And you're gonna pull up the Scott book too. Do you have a visual? Because uh, I yeah, I I am. Okay, cool. So here, so here's the, let me know if that, that shows. Let's see. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, it shows. Okay. Okay. So, so the two, the two slides, the two books that are shown here, uh, Top Soil and Civilization, it's Vernon Gill Carter and Tom Dale. Um, I think that book was first published in the mid 1950s. And then I think they ran like the second edition was like in the seventies or something. Huh. And then. And the collapse, Jared Diamond. That's from two thousand and five, um, uh, I believe. And so, if we go to the next slide, so the most commonly cited causes of civilizational collapse in both uh, Diamond's book and in Carter and Dale's book, and I think probably David Montgomery in his in, in his book, book Dirt talks about the same things, um, are deforestation, and habitat destruction, soil problems, which would include. Um, erosion, salinization, and fertility losses, and water management problems. 
Um, these are all, of course, um, directly related to soil health. And I think what's interesting is, um, is that they aren't necessarily three different modes of failure, that everything that follows from the first, um, from the first failure mentioned is the logical progression, right? So if you, if you destroy the forest and you destroy a habitat, you get rid of the vegetation, you're going to have soil problems because you just wiped out the, the, the primary generators of organic matter that builds up the soil. Yeah. So, and then once you have the soil problems, you, don't, you no longer have the, the things that generate the organic matter that builds the soils. So you're going to have problems with erosion and, and salinization or, or soil salting, and you're going to lose fertility because you don't have anything that's reinvesting into that bank of, of nutrients. Right. Um, and not, not to mention, you know, also the, you know, the biology that's involved. And then lastly, you know, the water management problems are also, that's, that's about right. Because if you don't have the organic matter to, to, to provide the means of storage for water, and then if the ground becomes so hard and impermeable that you can't put water back into the ground, right. um, then you're going to have, you're yeah. going to have problems with your water. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, you don't have trees. and you don't have trees right. and, to help make the rain. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So exact. So, I mean, and I want to come to, to, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to come to a presentation um, from Professor Milan Milan where he talks about how uh, it was a paper he wrote called Water Begets Water. He said that ve vegetation is the midwife right. Right, of, 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 you know, of basically of, of uh, precipitation or of water. Right. Is in that you, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say in your presentation, do you, do you get to or are you going to talk about the relevance of some of his calculations of restoration in Spain? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, right, I'll, I'll right. bring that up in just a moment. So, right, right. I mean, so the, the great thing about Aha, there he is. There he is. Yeah, I'm sorry. Ramis, we lost you. Yeah. Okay, sorry, guys. I just, I just went downstairs to make sure my family didn't sabotage me. Start watching videos <laughs> or something, right? Okay. No, no, they're, they're, they're good. It's, it's all right. So where was I? Okay. Okay, so you had your screen up. You were talking about um, you were talking about so the deforestation, soil, water. You were bringing right. it back, and you, you were going to talk about Milan, Milan, um, but you were right. still kind of in that in that flow. Yeah. So, so the the the, the great thing about Professor Milan, uh, Professor Milan, Milan, this this Spanish uh, uh, climatologist, uh, who I you know I I had found out about through uh, John. Um, I had a chance to meet him in uh, Switzerland. Uh, no, I'm sorry, not Switzerland. Uh, Holland in uh, uh, Den Bosch. In um, that was in the fall, you know, probably November, Novemberish. And um, he was able to, um, you know, give give me uh, uh, some of his um, some of his research in the form of a you know presentation that really, that covers a lot of this stuff. And it, and it really is, it's, it's fascinating. And specifically, again, he's looking at the dynamics of what we see in Spain. And, and not only just what's happening in Spain, but generally speaking, what's happening in the Mediterranean basin. Um, you know, specifically with the, the way that precipitation is, is behaving you know, the climate dynamics in the, in the Mediterranean basin. Now, of course, he has an interest in what's happening in the western portion of the Mediterranean basin because, of, because they've effectively lost a lot of their, um, what they would typically have in the summer, um, their precipitation that would fall over the course of the, you know, the last several years. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, you've seen an increasing problem with, you know, drought and fire in the, in the Iberian Peninsula is because they've, you know, they've lost, um, you know, the moisture. And not only that they lost, lost the moisture, but with, with the changes in land use and with the removal of a lot of the vegetation, then, of course, this is going to affect, um, you know, not only the amount of moisture that is able to stick around in the atmosphere. You have problems with, you know, you have issues with ado. I mean, you have the inversion layer in the atmosphere. You have, um, again, the hardening of the ground, so you don't have the same uh, degree of, of infiltration of water. So the hydrological dynamics change. 
um, uh, the you know the 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 to again store and hold heat and release it again it's dissolved into uh, sort of a thermal capacitance and dynamics of what's happening in atmosphere. He um he was able to uh, provide I think some really great information um, with regard to the to this particular issue. So he um let me see if I can pull up some of this stuff. Uh, so current slide show. Okay, so let me know if this okay if um shows. Sorry, you guys. You guys see this? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, hold on. How about now? Now you started. Your, here it is. There it is. Okay, so this is this is part of what he um you know had given us. So here um the water resources. Uh, provided by precipitation from the large weather systems, um, and again, this is re regarding the the you know, you know the the hydrological cycle. And what he says is the current wisdom. Um, so here he he mentions uh, the amount of available water depends on the location of the watershed and can result from different types of precipitation. So generally speaking, he says you know, judging from the fifty years of Precipitation data he has on what's happening in Spain, um, and he is in Valencia. That depending on where you are in the you know in the region, that of course some places are going to have more precipitation than others, simply because what the the dynamics between the ground and the atmosphere are going to be quite different. You know you're going to have some areas that are going to have more vegetation than others, and then and then if that's the case, then the the nature of the rainfall and the the period the periodicity of the rainfall the intensity of the rainfall um, and then what happens you know pre and post rainfall is going to is going to be you know quite different than somewhere else that doesn't necessarily have those same factors uh, so here in the Mediterranean region of Valencia there are three main precipitation components originating from three different weather regimes and affecting different parts of the territory right the most volatile of these components is the one due to summer storms and he's and what he said is that there that there's summer storms have changed over the time that land use has changed. Now, sp specifically, um, here's a picture of the, the cloud cover that would, would collect over um, some of the, the hills and the mountains. And of course, you'd get that whole orographic effect um, measure to have moist air masses be driven up higher and uh, higher into the atmosphere. And then eventually, if you have enough moisture in the right you know the right temperature and pressure conditions it, it precipitates out but but that's all heavily influenced by whether or not you have the vegetation on the ground which can help to buffer or mediate or drive those 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 dynamics now this this figure was um the one that was particularly of interest to me when when he showed it um uh at in in holland so here in the in the top portion of the figure uh, large scale leaf subsidence, the precipitated water vapor and pollutants are advected out of the region. Obviously, you see here on the ground, you see much more in the way of vegetation. And, and as a result of, of having those things be made available, which, which again can moderate the, the effect of temperature, the amount of moisture in the air, um, that you're going to have a certain amount of of um, of of water be be made available, fall back down as rain, you know, over the amount of time that it's that it's able to also dwell in that area. So of course you have time. You've got um, again the, the the amount of evapotranspiration that that is um, that is being provided by the vegetation. Obviously, again, temperature that's affected by um, albedo effects. Um, and then all, and then depending on the rainfall the ability to get it back into the ground and then slow the amount of time uh, or extend the amount of time that that water is moving through a given landscape and then can be cycled back up into the atmosphere that's going to affect the pain you have um, within a given location so he had said something about um, needing uh, upwards of 21 grams of water per kilogram of air in order for you to have in order for you to have rain 
And I think presently, um, you simply don't have those, that, that concentration of water per kilogram of air because the vegetation, the vegetation is no longer there, which allowed for that, for that slow, Transpiration. steady release. Yeah. Right, right. So you don't, have, you, don't have, you don't have the amount of water that's being put back out into the atmosphere that can then be, again, driven up into those higher elevations and then eventually fall as rain. And so he talked about also how the, because of, of the, the, the way that the, the air in a given region would cycle, you would also be able to have that cycling of pollutants, right? And then you would have kind of more and more and more and more of that, you know, of partic the particulates in the air. And you would get a real concentration of, of pollution in certain areas. And then, and then the other thing I thought was interesting was he said that, that although you may have a loss of precipitation in one portion of the Mediterranean basin, what it's resulted in is an, is an increase in rainfall in other parts of the Mediterranean basin. And then specifically, he said, if you go to the further east and even up into Central Europe, you'll, you'll, you have an increase in the amount of, uh, in the number of um, flood events. Right. So you've lost the water in the west, increased it in the east. And, and so, so, you so you have that same thing that's occurring, you have some variation of that that's occurring in lots of different places, in, um, you know, across the globe. Sure. Because, because, you know, everybody has some version of that change in land use that has um, resulted in the removal of the, of the vegetation, of the tree cover, of the grasses, whatever was, you know, was helping to get that water back out into the atmosphere. Everybody's got a version of that. Right. So you're going to have, you know, you're going to have that, you know, these wild swings, you know, between, um, you know, the, the whole drought flood cycle, you know, you now, because you've lost the buffer in the landscapes that, that, that mock the extremes. I mean, you know, Judith is in on this, uh, you know, is, is, is uh, hopefully she, I mean, Judith's written a whole book she's about, here, you yeah. know, yeah, Judith's written a whole book about this, you know, this stuff, and you know, she's someone who would who, who could talk at length about this. But you know, that it's it's like, how do you solve that problem? And 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 I think you know, especially when we when we get to talking about the issue, you know, the issue of climate change. I mean, you know, if if you want to look at the two, you know, two of the the, the big drivers of of, of what and in terms of uh, you know the the the, the, the weirding of weather is, um, I mean, the, mo the two of the more significant greenhouse gases would be um, not only carbon, and carbon gets all the press, but it's water vapor. It's water, mm -hmm. right? So wa and water has a massive, you know, has massive heat capacitance, massive thermal capacitance. I mean, this would also explain why, you know, the, the, the increase in the, in the severity and the power of the storms that are happening in various parts of the globe is, is it just simply more water so you know more water up here and and it's and and the way that it would you would have that sort of transaction between the and the atmosphere is completely interrupted because what would send the water back out into the atmosphere is no longer in the landscapes and the right? so you got to put the stuff back. right yeah yeah you know you get exactly you don't have you don't have the condensation surfaces so the the evaporation condensation cycles are all screwed up and, and, you know, we have to remember that there's a massive amount of heat transfer as you go from, you know, between evaporation and condensation. Right. Massive amount. Huge. You know, in again, in addition to the albedo effects of having that, you know, that green, you know, the color green as opposed to the light color that you have from exposed light soil where the light just gets bounced right back out, you know, to, into the atmosphere. Right. So it's just, it's just all of these all of these things that sort of, um, you know, they collude to, you know, to create the, you know, the situation that we, that we now currently have. And I think that one other point about um, what happens with those, those dynamics that we saw, um, those factors that, that, that Jared Diamond mentioned is, you know, the, the removal of uh, uh, vegetation uh, and deforestation and the soil problems and the water management problems. I think what's really fascinating about that, especially with regard to carbon, is um, 
you know, let, let's name it. What are the three largest carbon storages on the planet? Oceans. The Great Plains is a big one. Right. Aggressive. So we have oceans, just generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. Grasslands, maybe. Or is that <laughs> so one? I see everybody. So I just yeah. So so I just see pe people are <laughs> are putting it into the into the chat. Yeah. So just yeah. so it's going to be oceans, uh, soils, soil everywhere, veg yeah. veg and vegetation yeah. in that order, right? And then and then the difference between the ratio of the amount of carbon that's stored between all of those is is pretty significant. I mean, so soils soils store something on the order of three times the amount of carbon that that vegetation does. And then, and then the oceans, you know, are, you know, markedly uh, a larger proportion than the other two. Now, what's interesting is you've just lost two for the price of one. The moment you, you get vegetation is you basically, you've lost the vegetation as a carbon storage, and then you increasingly lose the soils as a source of carbon storage, right? Because what creates the soils is gone. And yeah. so now all so now all of the carbon goes to the oceans, which would explain why they're acidifying. acidifying. Yeah. Yeah. So again, it's it's all I mean, you can't look at any of these things in you know in isolation because they're all intimately connected. You know, it's a it's a body. It's a you know, it's a terrestrial body basically. That's what I that's what I liken it to. And so you you have to put the you basically I mean part of what we're doing or what we're proposing to do in this whole ecosystem restoration camp thing is you have to train people to put the organs back right right you, you have to reconstitute the body right in order to in order to set things right yeah so if, so so if you don't, so if you don't do that i mean you can't fake that yeah you know what i mean like you can't like you have to do that yeah Cause, so if you don't do it you know it, the, everything that depends on the body's vitality and its health is go, is in mortal danger right that's our ultimate holistic context together, right? This, this, no, exactly. This body of earth, yeah. So, so in Spain, we've got this camp that's, that's working on restoring this five hectares, but that's, of course, interconnected with all the lands that the Chico de Guzman family owns and all the potential inspirational effect in the region that that can have. So let's get into what is happening on that particular five hectares right. in Spain and what are the what's happening there? What's what's been there? What's what's what are the hopes there? What are we moving towards? Okay, so so initially when when the when the project was was proposed, um, we wanted to to pull people in. Uh, eventually, when we when we realized we had a, we had an actual site and it was going to happen, uh, we just tried to get you know all the people that we knew that could provide some kind of useful. Input. So immediately, you know, one of the first part of was to get you know Dan Halsey involved because um you know he's he's a you know he's a great designer I mean I think you know quite a few people I, I would think have, have been able to see some um one of the there there were and there were folks in Spain also that I thought would be great in particular in particular um uh Jesus Ruiz uh from a company called Lenia Clave and he does um uh not only permaculture but also my design work uh i thought he would be perfect to get involved and then there are and then obviously there, there are other people that are connected to you know our mutual networks and so we just wanted to get something down on paper that would give us a, a decent physical layout something that made sense given the you know given the circumstances and then um and then a, a sensible work plan um to provide a mainframe design and um and of course that you know that requires you know a certain amount of funding to be able to bring in you know the equipment or the people with the know-how that could then do the the on-site work at least the initial mainframe on-site work so there were earth movers that were eventually brought in to try to you know put in some of the features like you know swales there were some dams that had been built on site um to, to at least take advantage of whatever water would show up, you know, we have some means of storage. I think the, the, the other part that had to be taken into consideration was the degree to which the decompaction on site had to, um, had to be dealt with. And, and that's something that we really didn't, um, we really didn't get an opportunity to, to, to see up close and personal until, 
a couple of us went down in the fall. And we were able to see some of the um, some of the portions of the you know the the, the you know the work site that had some features that were dug in. I think they were they were meant to be uh, 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 water storage or infiltration features, and they just seemed like they were just kind of holes that were dug with the, the bucket of a you know a backhoe or something or an excavator. And it wasn't until I had a chance to you know to go look at the profile in the hole that you could see the degree of compaction um, which was simply a consequence of running heavy equipment and you know, planting you know planting the grain crops so you could see probably from about maybe 35 30 or 35 centimeters down to well at least the hole went down to probably 20 centimeters um, uh, there's, I mean everything was just closed you know super closed and you could also see the areas where there were lots of clumpy you know, sort of clumpy, uh, uh, just clods. Clods. Ramis. I think we lost Ramis. The soil. Okay. So, Ramis, you're back. Yeah, I'm back? Okay, yeah. good. You were frozen. Yes. Did you know that you were frozen? No, I didn't. Okay, you, you were at the word clod. <laughs> so just so just say claw, <laughs> and then it just stopped. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's cool. All right, so, so yeah, as you can see that they were, you know, on the surface. If they did run back, there you are. Come back, back. You're back. Oh, we good. Okay, good. All right, so where was it? So clods, right? Clods. clods? So basically, clods. at the clods. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, clods. Okay, so the you know the 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 clods thing was was really um, you know between the clods that we saw on the surface you know once you start doing some of the work and then what we could see from the compaction you know once you get below ground I mean it became very clear that you know we needed to use something along the lines of a key line plow or a subsoiler um, to to break up as much of the compaction compaction as we possibly could. Um, before we were really able to do anything um, that would have any real lasting effects. And again, because of where we're working, time was of the essence because, I mean, by, by the time we had seen uh, some of that, some of, some of, you know, what, what we saw happening on site, we knew that we were well into the part of the year where we're likely to see rain. Right. So since we only have, you know, 250 meters if we're, if we're fortunate to work with we had to you know we had to, to to really scramble to try to try to catch as catch can so fortunately um you know in that area there, there there were folks who had some of the equipment that we needed uh alfonso happened to have a uh, use of a um you know of a of a ripper that i think went down to about i think down to 70 70 centimeters um, which is pretty was pretty good. Yeah, it was seventy. Yeah. And yeah, and then um, he also had a tiller that that would uh, that went down to about twenty centimeters. I'm not sure whether or not they ran the tiller because ideally, you know, you you could you could run the the you know you could run the the ripper and then the tiller to to prepare um, say the laying down of the compost, which was also something that was purchased. Yeah. I think, and I and then I, yeah, I know there was two. Lengths of Ripper. They did the shorter one, and then they did the seventy. Same one. Um, yeah. And then I'm not sure that was when I was there, but I they might have yeah. done uh, something with the seating. I don't remember if that happened. Yet. Well, they they eventually. I, I know they. You know, they went out and got. I believe it was thirty tons yeah. of compost, and it was a locally made compost. And there had always been a concern about being able to get access to a halfway decent quality compost. At the very least, um, something that could buy us uh, an increase in organic matter, which would allow for, you know, improved water holding capacity, but we didn't want to necessarily end up dosing the place with heavy metals, for example, you know, which is, of course, a problem that um, can, can come from uh, using, say, a municipally made compost, mm -hmm. um, if it, especially if it's using, like, you know, sludge or something like that. So, um, you know, we, we, and again, all of this is happening as we're racing against, um, you know, the possibility of missing the, the you know, the, the window of time that we knew we would likely be able to get access to some rain. 
So it was just a matter of being able to just make some relatively quick decisions. Fortunately, we had, you know, some of the funds that, that allowed for that work to be done and, you know, credit to the, the folks that were on site. I mean, I, you know, we were steadily, you know, throwing a lot of information at them. And, um, and I think, you know, all things considered, they did a great job of, of, of actually, you know, putting, putting that information to use. So we were able to identify um, a place that, um, that, that had, you know, some decent cover crop uh, seeds, a good, you know, a, a yeah. good kind of local variety that could be used. Um, uh, we know that, uh, you know, some of the volunteers were able to do some work with, with researchers from the University of Murcia. Mm -hmm. that had access to mycorrhizal fungi Professor Gomez which, there. yeah that was great man yeah. jake actually got to go down and meet her and talk with her that was really cool so you go prop prop props props tim yeah and the and also so, the, des the desert truffle too which is a pretty cool thing yeah but right right ecto mycorrhizal yeah right exactly ecto mycorrhizal fungi and i think that and that whole that's a whole discussion on its own is oh, yeah. is you know the, the use of of those types of materials and and the integration of, of those types of biological elements to, to help, you know, drive, drive the process of, of um, remediation. So we, you know, we would, we, obviously, you know, all of this stuff is, has been happening without the benefit of, of necessarily doing any formal training with, with folks on site. And I think this was, you know, this has been, I think one of the challenges of, of initiating, uh, you know, this kind of project is, the, the sequence of events that would eventually lead to, you know, being able to do the work necessary. And I think at that point, the, 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 um, the priority was doing anything we could to just take advantage of, of you know, the, the access to water um, that would then be able to initiate the, the, the reestablishment of vegetation on site. Mm -hmm. So that, so that was, um, I mean, it was a bit, it was a little bit of like trial by fire, really. And I thought that was, and it was great. I think, again, everybody handled it brilliantly. Um, you know, folks, folks, you know, we got down and, and you know, um, you know, people started making indigenous microorganisms, effective microorganisms. They, you know, they um, were able to get folks making, you know, some, some thermophilic compost on site to, in the hopes of eventually doing some sort of um, aerated compost teas. Uh, and, and I think one of the benefits of, of really being challenged in that respect of not having the ideal situation is, is I think you really find out who really is down to do the work necessary to, um, you know, to get this kind of work going. Right. And if, and if folks, and if, and if folks are able to stick around when things are not perfect, then I then you know that's a pretty good indication of of who is really you know about it as we say you know yeah. in you know in the states that you really do have you really do have people that are you know they 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 really want to do this and they're really serious and 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 they're not afraid to get their hands dirty and they're not afraid to make a few mistakes you know that in 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 the course of of trying to learn and I think that's that's an important part of you know what of what's been happening here so. Um, well, what else happened? Okay, well, well, one of the other really important things that that had um, that it, uh, we were able to get accomplished was we had someone uh, step up and do uh, provide us with um, some soil analysis services, mm -hmm. and um, we were able to get you know a, a really you know decent uh, idea as to the the sampling of the initial conditions of you know, certain portions of the site. And um, I know I'm going to get his name wrong, but his name is uh, a French gentleman named Francis, Francis Bouquel. I, I guess that's his name. Hmm. And um, he had, uh, let's see if I can pull up this, this first, um, this first analysis that he had given to us. <coughs> um, he, uh, no, that's not it. So he was he was able to give us an idea as to you know the the um, you know the percentage of soil organic matter we had um, the deficiencies you know in terms of the nutrient the the, the nutrient deficiencies on site um, uh, pH of course 
I don't, I'm not sure if we really had any ideas to what types of biological activity we had, but um, you know, we, we were able to get uh, a, a really great initial um, idea of what it was that specifically needed to be done to remediate um, you know, the, the soils on site to get them to the point to where, okay, now, now we're cooking with gas, so to speak. Yeah. So um, I think most of, most of what we were able to see in terms of the, you know, the deficiencies and the, you know, and the, and the, and the conditions that, that, that are, you know, current there is, again, it's consistent with what you would likely see in areas that have uh, been under that type of regime of management in, in agricultural production over an extended period of time. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't, I, I don't think it was anything that we, you know, we weren't expecting. I mean, funnily enough, there, there was actually probably a little bit more in the way of soil organic matter than I, than I had anticipated. Mm. But it was, you know, it was probably, you know, somewhere in the area of one and one, one and a half percent, um, in some places, maybe a little more. Um, a little less than 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 two percent, which was which which was actually quite surprising. Hmm. And pH wise, you know, the, the the soils are as expected, you know, quite alkaline. Yeah. So they're probably anyway anywhere from um, seven point nine to probably eight and a half. Mm-hmm. And um, and so again, depending on the, you know, the, the we I don't think we got any um, numbers for like cation exchange capacity or or anything like that, but um, you know that that's the, that's the kind of information that we you know we ultimately would like to keep track of. You know, so friability of the soils, permeability, infiltration rate, you know, for water, right. um, you know, all, uh, you know, all, all of those things um, are going to be really important for us to keep track of, so that we you know we understand what we're doing, and we can we can you know we can get some understanding as to what are the more effective um, remedies. And, and turning and, and changing things. And all of that so we can plant perennial living things that will grow, grow over time and become a whole system, right? Right, no, exactly. And I think that, that's, that's also another part of, of what it was that we were, um, that had been put together initially was, was you know, a, a, a list of, of species yeah. um, that are, of course, appropriate for, the, you know, the situation and the circumstances, but also that are appropriate for the place. Right. So, you know, obviously, in, uh, initially, in a lot of the, um, you know, in, in a lot of the areas that are, especially, you know, they suffer from uh, being in a semi-arid or an arid climate, um, in a heavily de- degraded site, you, you need um, typically drought tolerant and also salt tolerant. Uh, varieties um, and then if you're in an area that is uh, you know fire prone um, you, you also want something that is is um, you know fire tolerant or can can um, you know help to uh, reduce the possibility that you you know you can have a, have a, have a problem with that though that's going to be part of the initial recipe to be put into place but so you know, I've, you know, we've talked about you know hardy pioneer species. Many of them are going to probably be leguminous. Um, uh, ideally, we could eventually get to varieties that are um, um, endemic. You know, to the area. I mean, it'd be great to be able to reestablish oaks. You know, the type. You know, the types of varieties with the oaks and 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 mm-hmm. whatever guild is uh, goes along with that. But. Um, you know, one of, one of the other really critical uh, issues here um, is, is, you know, one of the constraints we have for this site in, in La Juanquiera is that uh, due to certain regulations and uh, uh, stipulations with regard to land use, you, 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 you have to plant certain varieties that have some sort of economic um, benefit. You know, they, they, they can, you know, they have some way of contributing to the local economy, which makes all the sense in the world. Um, so, it, you know, it's just a matter of being able to find the right balance between something that provides the ecological function that would be ideal and then something that also could be used to bolster um, the local economy so people can actually make a living. 
Um, and, and those things aren't list, necessary. Right? Say it again? I don't think acorns are on the list yet, are they? Um, not that I know of, but I, I could be, I could be wrong. Right. But I, but you know, it's, it's, um, you know, I think that's, that's part of the, you know, the dance yeah. <laughs> in trying to figure these things out is you have to understand. And I mean, the, those, those two things aren't necessarily working across purposes. Right. I mean, they're not, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive, right? right? That, you know, it's, it's either, you know, something that benefits you know, the, the local ecologies, or it's something that actually creates some sort of economic return. Right. Uh, is that they, they both have to, they, 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 they both need to be one and the same. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's that kind of, you know, really simplified linear reductionist thinking mm -hmm. that has created the situation that we're currently faced with in the first place. Right, totally. And I know they're talking about too, like some aromatics and stuff, like they're actively thinking about what, not just to tick off things off the list, to get things that are economically relevant, but how can we bring things in that can become a part of a generative economic system and create more restoration, right? So. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean this is where, um, you know, having a, an organization like Common Land be involved is, is, so, um, is so important. Because I think common common land's been able to, you know, to it's been able to create a model that allows for conceptualizing, you know, some of the frameworks and and some of the, the templates that, that would need to be um, made available to people so they can make smart choices of of how to be able to hit all of the targets. Now, if you know, for those who aren't familiar with um, with common land, uh, this is the uh, you know, this is their website, and they have this whole concept of uh, the four returns, right? Return of inspiration, return of social capital, return of natural capital, return of financial capital. Um, and, and within those four returns, you have what they've called, um, what they've termed three zones. You have, a, again, a natural zone, a combined zone, and an economic zone, and under each of those zones, you have investment, and then the anticipated returns, and and being able to explicitly identify all of these these different areas and these different targets that you're trying to to hit when putting together a plan uh, that's focused on ecological restoration. You know, it's not only a matter of of uh, of being concerned with that. It, you also it also has some kind of sense to, uh, especially lo like local economies. You know, it has to make some sense to uh, the people who are going to be directly impacted by whatever work is being done um, on the land that they occupy. And and in many ways, a lot of what's being discussed here is is really about the reestablishment of local economies as opposed to having people be um, dominated by the dynamics that are connected to global economies. Right. And which, which large, yeah. Yeah, which is important for the resilience of these landscapes that we restore, right? If it's, if it's just a nice, I mean, it, that, this balance between wildlife and economy and that whole thing, it's like, if we don't find something that society accepts, then it might get clear just like it did 500 years ago, right? Right, no, a, absolutely. I mean, one of the people I've, you know, I've often um, quoted in, in at least trying to communicate, um, you know, what, which, what, what, is, what we're trying to achieve, you know, actually and maybe I guess philosophically is is Wendell Berry and I think you know Wendell Berry has is, is talked you know he, I think he's really done a great like a really powerful um, job of, of communicating exactly what it is that's wrong about the types of economies that have dictated how how land is used how resources are used how people are used you know, or misused um, you know he's he's really been able to that in a, in a very clear and a very powerful way. And I think specifically, you know, the point he makes about, 
you know, if, if, you're, if, if we're concerned about land use, you know, then you're really looking at um, what is essentially an economic problem, right? Because um, land is um, the basis for any and every local economy. I mean, in, you know, and also every international economy is there's this ever increasing um, race to try to find um, newer uh, uh, and 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 more unspoiled sources of of, of natural resources um, that is able to provide the, the ability to generate wealth. So, in order to ultimately address the problem of land abuse or land degradation, you have to address the the basis upon which the economy for that place um you have to you have to address the basis of of, of the economy and how it rent and how it runs right. so if the if you know if the if the basis of the economy is sound then the the state of the resource base will be sound right and if and if the basis of the economy is unsound then you'll find that you know your your resource base is going to reflect that right um, I know we'll probably we'll have a more dedicated Q and A time later, but I, Angela's kind of popping with questions on this issue, um, so maybe we'll just let her. Yeah, maybe questions. it's probably a good idea to, to get people involved in this. So yeah, let's, rather than hear me, rather than hear me babble. Oh well, no, your babbling is is fantastic. Um, <laughs> but she asks, so do you have any restoration project ideas that are exclusively for nature, wildlife, etc.? Is it always going to be about economic return? Um, so there's a lot in that, I guess. But like, I know, I know Alfonso. You know, in my musicology interview with him, he talked about a desire to reintroduce wildlife at some point, and that's a indicator for its own sake. And then possibly in the future, maybe she's getting at like, does this have a point where we, I, or I, or is, is there currently any? focus on just wildlife that kind of adds to the whole mosaic and then where we're we moving in the future, you know? So this whole economic return thing, is that a permanent, uh, I don't know. Yeah. You see her question. Well, 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 again, it's, you know, I don't think it's necessarily a matter of either or. Yeah. So, so one of the, so one of the things I was, I was just um, like, actually this is another point from, from, uh, from James Scott's book is that you know uh, uh, from against the grain is he is is he had talked about how you know human beings for millennia have have basically um been engaged in what he's called um niche construction or you know a way i've thought about it is like habitat engineering so the, you know the, the point being is that if you if you create the habitat for wildlife to 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 be able to exist then it's like you, you don't necessarily have to reintroduce them you right. just have to sort of set the you just have you have to have, you have to set the table right. I'll be a great example of that right uh, you know the first the first course i taught um was in detroit was in the east side of detroit and, um and you know detroit is detroit michigan and it's a which is a fascinating city I mean, it's it's more or less the place that the American middle class was created, you know, um, and you know heavily, you know, the quintessential American industrial city. And as the nature of you know labor has changed, and the way that you know we you know things are are manufactured, and the way that labor is utilized to manufacture those things, that that again, that the 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 city is, has changed. It's changed dramatically because the things that initially brought people to the city aren't necessarily there anymore. They've kind of moved elsewhere. And those people that were capable of being able to go to where the work was, they, they went and the people that weren't have, have been, have remained in the city, mm -hmm. um, which is, a, and, and, and the dynamics behind that are a lot more complicated. I'm not just going to get into that, but the effect thereof is that you've had, as the as the the city has depopulated, oh, you know, probably since the fifties or sixties. I mean, in truth, um, that increasingly more portions of the city has has basically returned to a type of uh, urban prairie, 
And, and so one of the things that I was really taken aback by was how many pheasants I saw hmm. while I was in Detroit. I was like, wow, well, these pheasants here. Really? You know, <laughs> yeah, to, to, I was all over the place. Like, why are all these pheasants? I mean, it's just Detroit. It was the Motor <laughs> City. There were, there, were fe- there were pheasants all over the place. <laughs> and I think, and, and, you know, I think the other, one of the other things that I was really um, amazed by was how um, – just, I mean, you go into neighborhoods that probably 40 years ago, there'd be houses. I mean, comp- like all the streets are lined with houses. And like, every, and then, you know, you go there in 2010 or 2015 or 2018, and increasingly more of the city is just basically empty. Like the houses have been cleared, and then the, pl- and then the lots that, have, that used to have houses have just gone back to, like it's been overgrown. Right. You know, the trees are growing over. And, and so, you know, you, you hear about, you know, there's more deer or there's more, you know, th- th- there's more. Um, I mean, I believe during the time that I was there, someone had reported seeing a beaver. A in beaver. Detroit. In Detroit. In, in Detroit for the first time, <laughs> for the first time in, uh, it was 75 years. <laughs> it was the first beaver they saw in 75 years. Wow, that's huge. Right? Yeah. So, so, you know, so I think what that seemed to indicate to me was that if the, ha- if the habitat is there, the, the animals find it. Right. I mean, Detroit apparently is also, um, there, there, was, there was something, um, there was something written about how Detroit is, the, 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 the metro area has like the most wild bees because there are all these urban apiaries that are popping up. So you can buy like really good honey, like wild honey from, from Detroit because again, there's all of this really great bee habitat. So, you know, the, 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 job, the job that we need to be doing is basically recreating or reestablishing the habitat that will allow for, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, the wild animals of, of, of all varieties to be able to live. Right. Because the reason you don't see them anymore is because they don't have any place to live. Right. Or you know, food. they, they go, they, they gotta go, they, huh? Say or it again. Food. Or food. Yeah. Yeah. There's no, there's no food for them. So they, they're going to go to where they can actually exist i.e. You, you tend to exist in places that you're able to find food or whatever it is that you need to support your ability to live. And if those things aren't where you are, you go somewhere else. Right. So I think, so that's, that's I think in large part, a lot of what we're doing um, as designers, if we're effective, is we are creating habitat. Right. Right. We are, we are constructing niches. Yeah. Right. We are, we are providing... This, we're providing the setting or creating or creating the circumstances for the ability to create or generate some kind of yield that includes having um, any and all possible ecosystem or ecological elements that would help to sustain and improve, you know, the ecological functioning, which produces a yield in both products and services, right. you know, in terms of, you know, of the ecological variety. Including including remnant animals from that we just like we're trying to bring in relevant plants, you know. Eventually, that'll that'll come in once they have a, a place, right? Totally. So so you have so so when talking about and using the term niche construction, I think it's a very it's a very precise term because when you're talking about niche construction, you are making a space, you are creating a place for that thing. Yeah. Right, you're creating a pl- you're creating a space or a place, yeah, in terms of the physical space, but also in in terms of the temporal space, in yeah. terms of time, right? So you you're engineering or designing space and time for various ecological or ecosystemic elements, right. and then in being able to include them, it in- it improves or increases the the functional um, stability and vitality and integrity of you know of a, of a given landscape right yeah and you know i guess the fact that the wildlife will come back also entails that there's some remnant ecology in the area for that they're not extinct you know um and so it preserving just to kind of continue on her question for just a second angela's yeah preserving 
you know, wild habitat is a key part of, as we restore integrated systems, giving them a place to grow back into. So it's all really one, one picture, right? I mean, this whole. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, in my mind, it, you know, I can't think of any of these things in yeah. compartment, yeah. in compartments anymore yeah. because you realize that, you know, none of this stuff happens in isolation. Right. So, so you have to be able to think about this as a, um, as a connected whole. Right. Right. So, so, so really what all you are as a designer is you're a facilitator, right? Like you're not, you're not controlling anything. Like Like really what you're doing is it's like you're opening the door for all of this other stuff to come in and you're just creating a place at the table for as many different guests as possible. Yeah. So you just, so you're just a host and you, and you're like, you're a matchmaker. Right. And you and and you and you're creating opportunities for as many different partners as possible right. to meet up. Right. And so the the better you are as a designer, the better or the better you are as someone who is able to you know understand how this whole thing is is how it runs and how it operates, the more connections you're able to make, the better the outcome. Right? You're able to make as many different as as many beneficial connections as possible within right. a given arrangement within a given space right i like that set set the table you know t- tablecloth plates and then the food right just, just like bottom up with the start with the soil you know and then it'll that's it <laughs> we start and, the, and start the banquet and, up no and there and there you go i mean that and and that's why the you know this the soil part of the discussion is so critically important because that's where it all happens Right. Because so if if you don't if if the integrity if the functional integrity of of soil is not insured, you can't do anything. And even in talking about and even in talking about the functional integrity of soil, ultimately what you're talking about is you you inevitably come back to water. Right. Like it all like it all starts with water. And it, and it, but not only water, but there's also you know it also comes between water and air. Mm-hmm. So, so really what you're trying to design is, is, the, is the integration, is the establishment of that cycling and that ability to store water and air, which then opens the door to all of the other elements. It opens the door to the vegetative elements. It opens the door to the, to the biological elements that cycles all the nutrients, that, that provides the basis for all of the biogeochemical cycles to occur, mm-hmm. which then which then is able to produce the types of yields um, that leads to everything else. Right. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, we're going to get a little bit back to Angela in a minute because she's got another vein of questions that would be really maybe fun to get into, especially with Judith here uh, about veganism. But um, let's go to Harry for a second. Um, he's got questions about refugee camps. Yo, yeah. Oh, yeah. So could could a uh, ecosystem restoration camp be set up in a refugee camp to tra- says Harry to train the people who are directly feeling the consequences of land degradation uh, give them hope and a new worldview he says I recently watched a new documentary called It Will Be Green Again which is about a refugee camp in Cameroon watching that mm-hmm. doc made me think about setting up ecosystem restoration camps in refugee camps uh, what do you have to say about that? We're talking about displaced populations, human and others, and refugee situation is, of course, a part of that. You know, this whole cycle of cities and just collapse. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, well, I think what's interesting about you know about that particular situation is you know a, a lot of most of the places that I work in are you know again they're in areas that are arid or semi-arid, um, and many of those places are in a part of the world that is marked by quite a bit of conflict. So um, I'm talking about like North Africa. So, you know, for example, I've been, you know, I've taught in Tunisia, Morocco. I've done work in Western Sahara. Western Sahara is technically home to the longest running conflict on the continent of Africa since 1975. You know, um, funnily enough, this has some connection to Spain. I mean, it's the portion of, you know, Northwest Africa that had been formally annexed by Spain and then eventually they they left in 75 and then Mauritania and Morocco kind of rushed in and then that led to a a conflict that is now still happening technically um uh you know taught in you know uh the West Bank 
you know, Palestine and Israel. Taught in, um, you know, done work in Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, uh, Egypt, Oman, Yemen, you know, and then, you know, Jordan. And I think Jordan in particular is, is, is interesting in that um, the area where the, the, the Painting the Desert 2 project is in the, is in the Jordan River Valley, the Dead Sea Valley. Which, if you if you go from the site in El Jofa in Jawasidi, and you travel north up to the Zatari um, refugee camp, which is where basically everybody um, that's running from the conflict in Syria is being, um, or quite a few people that, that that have been running from the conflict in Syria, that's where they're being um, uh, accommodated. Um, we've actually had um, some. PRI folks do work in the Zatari refugee camp. Uh, even the area in Zatari, I mean, I'm sorry, not Zatari, in, um, in El Jofa, um, and, and the, you know, in, in the Jordan Valley, effectively a refugee area of people that had, had fled from, um, you know, from, from Israel-Palestine, uh, uh, probably either, either from around the time of the 67 or the oh, actually no. Well, some people have been been there since forty eight, but um, I think most recently, six, you know, either sixty seven or seventy three. So these are folks that have been trying to more or less kind of remake their lives um, in a really um, challenging area, really challenging setting. So I mean, Jordan is easily one of the most water stressed countries in the world. Uh, certainly in the Middle East, but you know, um, it's a, you know how do you, how do you make how do you make a life in a in a, in a place that um, doesn't have a great deal of water or arable land, and um, and a lot of what we've been trying to model, uh, you know, at that site in the valley is is precisely how to do that. Now, it's taken about it's taken Jeff and Nadia about almost twenty years to to formally get the Jordan government to to actually take up some of what is being demonstrated on that site and then do something by way of government to take it to a, a wider um, population of people. Now, they, they just issued a tender for a permaculture project to be established elsewhere in the Jordan Valley that can then be used as a model for, um, you know, agricultural business owners, and, and other people who make their living from the land, um, it's tried to demonstrate ways that that permaculture design ideas or regenerative um, agricultural ideas uh, could could then be put to use by locals, mm -hmm. and that would include, you know, refugee populations. Right. Um, I've had, you know, I've, I've worked in, uh, you know, Somaliland, and you know the situation that is, um, you know, that's been folks have had to, to deal with on the, the uh, in the Horn of Africa, you know, probably since the late 70s is certainly part of that whole, you know, what can we do for, you know, for people that are, you know, that are having to deal in either conflict zones or former conflict zones or places where, you know, there's chronic famine or chronic drought, you know, that, that would, you know, that's also a place where you'll find quite a bit of interest in this because people can see the usefulness of many of the ideas that are being offered, um, you know, by by permacul by systems like permaculture, which in many cases is is just sort of a, a re, it's just another presentation of things that maybe their their folks had done a long time ago, right? And and that they've just be, that just become um, estranged from because they've they've tried to become more modern or more technical in, in the way that they go about doing their agriculture. I mean, uh, just a really quick story. Um, I've taught two courses um, in, in Hadramot in, uh, in Yemen. Um, taught one in late 2011, early 2012, and then uh, the last course was during the fall of 2013. And during one of the courses, um, I think it was the first course, um, we were talking about um, food forests, you know, the, the whole concept of the food forest. And the first cohort of, of students we had were agricultural engineers and farmers from 
you know, from the Wadi, from Wadi Hadramaut. And one of the, the head ag engineers brought a, a book, an, a, a, a book of translated South Arabian poetry. And, and the reason why he put the book was because it had poems that would talk about what used to be plant landscapes, you know, in, in that region. And that in a way, the, uh, you know, the poetry was a way of being able to provide a reference, to the kinds of things that could be used um, in maybe a recreation of some of these old systems. And I think this is a way in, in about being able to address the whole problem, the, the challenge of refugees and, and how to help them is in a way, it's, it, this, is, this is almost a, a means for them to become reacquainted with what is really their, their historical or their cultural heritage vis-a-vis -vis, um, you know, their history as a people attached to land. You know? And I've had several people talking about that example. I've had lots of people tell me that, you know, well, we used to do that. You know, we used to do that at one point. And I was like, well, you know, do you do it anymore? He's like, not so much. You know, so in a way, um, you know, you can you can tell the condition of a people or get some con some indication as to the condition of a people in relation to the condition by looking at the condition of the landscapes. Right. And that there is a there is a you know, there is a symmetry there, you know, that they do sort of reflect one another and that when they become estranged from one another, you know, you'll see that reflected in their, in their situation or their circumstances and vice versa, you know, and, you know, so for better or for worse. And I think that is very much attached to addressing, like ultimately addressing the problem of, you know, refugee populations is you have to provide them a place, a physical location that they're able to, um, you know, that they're able to kind of claim for themselves and make a life for themselves, right. independent of anybody else. You know, independent of you know of, of having to be dependent on on other people right. to provide them with things that they're perfectly capable of providing themselves if they're you know if they're given an opportunity to do so and right. and they're supported in doing so. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Beautiful. Um, I think it'd be fun. Let's dive into maybe uh, Angela's question. I want to try something new here. Um, Judith, uh, would you be willing to possibly join? I could make you a panelist for a minute. Um, answer Angela's answer question, Angela's maybe, question maybe. With, Ramis with Ramis about, about, about veganism. About veganism. Oh, Ramis, Ramis, you're, you're Ramis, on speaker. You're, you're echoing. echoing. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm here. I'm just, I'm just trying to get a lamp. That's all. It's, it's a bit dark in here. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm here. Okay. We're going to try something new here. Okay. So we now have. Ramis, your echo is really bad. Really bad. Really bad. Okay. And then let's introduce, then let's introduce after you get your echo get off. Your echo off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, dude. I, I, was, I was thinking like guitar effects or something like that. Like yeah, no, I mean, it was, delay. it was beautiful. We had the, 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 <laughs> uh, the, the delay effect, yeah. Let's, let's introduce Judas. You want to introduce Judas Schwartz here, and then we'll, uh, then we'll field um, Angela's question about veganism. You want to introduce? I know you, you, you know her before, too. And, oh, you're talking about me? Yeah, J Judith. Well, Judith is, uh, is now a temporary panelist, and I know you, you sort of lit up, uh, you have some relation with it. You want to go ahead and introduce Judith? And yeah, I mean, Ju Judith is, is um, a wonderful journalist. Um, she's written, you know, some, some um, I think, some really important books on, you know, th that deal with a lot of what we've been discuss discussing. I mean, one of them, uh, let me see if I could find some of, the, some of her book titles. I'm going to do a plug for you there, Judith, okay, if you don't mind. <laughs> hey, I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, you, the, let let me brag about you. Oh, hey, all good. <laughs> yeah, so she so she she's written um, "Cow Save the Planet" and and other. Hold on, I got to get the whole title up. I want I want I don't want to short you here. There's a lot more to it than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't want I don't want to shorter. Yeah, cows save the planet and other improbable ways of restoring soil to, to 
to heal the earth. And the other one is um, water in plain sight, hope for a thirsty world. And, um, and I think she's, you know, I think as a, being a journalist, you know, who's, who's taken an interest in, in these topics, um, she's been able to use, I think, some really compelling language to communicate the importance of, of these issues. And hopefully that will, you know, pull more people in to become more involved or at least aware of, of these issues. So, I mean, I've, I've you know, I've, I've been um, privileged enough to, to be able to be introduced to her and become familiar with some of her work and hopefully more people will, will be able to do so. Yeah, and hi Judith, it's our first time meeting. It's good to meet you. Yeah. Wonderful to meet you. Yeah, is there anything, before we get, dive into this question, anything else you'd like to say to introduce yourself? Oh, goodness. Um, well, I don't know where everybody else is, but I'm here in Bennington, Vermont. Wonderful. So, where it's spring. Okay. And where there's plenty of water. I mean, really. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I'm next to a creek here in Oregon, so I, I, I feel you. <laughs> um, so, Angela's question, um, how does Ramis or Judith, or how do we feel about, she says, veganism as the way of the future? Um, she talks about how we haven't had this population of humans that we've had, um, and that millions of people, including herself, are moving towards veganism, um, and that it might not have as much credibility. Um, this whole issue, so we're talking about how we eat, how we live, what lives on the land. Um, can you guys speak, or Judith, maybe you want to start, uh, or either one? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, uh, you know, a few things. I mean, I would say that in many landscapes, you really, you know, for the landscape to really thrive, you do need animals on the land and to be integrate and to be managed properly. Um, and I can't really speak to health implications, but I do know a lot of people that feel that certainly for, for many people, having some animal products in your diet are important. But I, I think one thing that often gets lost, um, sometimes I, th I think that um, the, the move towards or like the campaign for veganism is in itself a symptom of our disconnection from the land. And I think people often want to do something positive environmentally and that just seems like something that is, you know, we've got, you know, looked at simplistically, it seems like that is more benign for the environment. But what we don't talk about is the ecological cost of, you know, clearing land for soybeans or clear, you know, every time a, a field is plowed, then you've made lots and lots of species homeless. And I mean, you know, I don't know if I'm, this is, probably isn't where you were going with this question, but the thought of food created in labs scares the heck out of me. <laughs> so anyway, those are a few thoughts. We can get into all of it. This is a deep dive, so there's no, there's no rules. Ramis, you have anything to add to that? You want to unmute yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, this is a well funny enough this is an issue that 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 bill talks about in the designer's manual um you know he discussed this back in okay so i've got the second first the second edition so this is published in 1988 and one of the things paraphrasing that he mentions in um in the book is he said look there's nothing wrong with veganism right or vegetarianism if, if you are producing your own food because this is a bit of a false issue. It's a red herring, whether or not you eat meat. And the issue isn't, the, the issue should not be, you know, the, the ecological benefits of whether or not you eat meat. Really what it comes down to is whether or not whatever food that you are consuming is, is either something that you are producing yourself, right? Or if you're purchasing it, you, you have an understanding of how that food has been produced and that it hasn't been produced or provided in a way that is, that is destructive. Because if, because if, for example, if you're a vegetarian and you're a vegan and you're not producing any of your food, one of the things you have to realize is the, the way in which most land historically has been destroyed 
has been through agriculture as, as a historical matter. So even if you look, let me see if I can pull up this graphic. If you look at, um, yeah, this is, a, this is a graphic from, uh, one of the UN agencies. I want to say that it's either the UNEP or um, yeah, well, so I can't remember which one, but it's basically it, it provides a graphic for the um, what has produced most of the land degradation in various parts of the globe. So here's so here's the. Um, yeah, so here's the graphic. Tell, let me know when you guys see it. There it is. Yeah, I see it. Okay, so you can see that it's it's been arranged according to continent. Okay, so um, so you can see here North America, the vast majority of the of the soil degradation that has been produced in North America has been by way of agriculture. Even if you look at um, at, at land use, and then again, the effects of the ways that the land has been managed in the pursuit of that particular activity. Um, I have this amazing graphic, um, yeah, here it is, of, of what it, what it, what's shown is the, uh, hold on, is this it, hold on. Yeah, it's it basically shows the the all of the tributaries of the waterways that lead to the Gulf of Mexico, and have basically um, contributed to the creation of a dead zone in the Gulf, where essentially you know you have these massive areas of hypoxia that that cause this enormous area of basically aquatic the death of aquatic life because all of the fertilizer and the excess nutrient that ends up you know, going into the water that produces eutrophication and then eventually produces, um, this produces um, these um, oxygen starved areas to where basically nothing can live. Now, um, many of these, these places that have experienced problems with um, you know, deforestation um, you know, and the clearing of land has not only been for the sake of, say, making grazing areas for domesticated livestock. But, um, you know, many, many of these places have been cleared um, to just create more cropland. Uh, in many cases, if you look in the, in the states, I mean, a lot of that, a lot of those crops are going to be things like corn and soy. Um, obviously, you know, there's wheat, there's, you know, there's rice, there's barley and oats and uh, soybeans. You know, all, all of those, those crops, which um, are commodified grains. Some of those things are being used in, you know, various, you know, vegetarian or vegan food products, you know, because there's, there, you know, people realize there's a market there. But um, the, the, the problem is ultimately one of whether or not we are, we ourselves are responsible for the, for the food that we consume. Do we, we actually produce the products that are used to support the lives that we live. And if you live in a Western, uh, if you live in a, a modern um, consumer-based industrial economy, uh, you know, the, the, no matter whether you're a vegan or a meat eater, you're not, you're not producing the food that you eat, right? You're buying it. And, and you are buying or you're purchasing these things based on your position on the, um, you know, on the, on the consumer food chain. Some of us happen to be, you know, buying higher up on that food chain than others, um, but it still produces um, what one would characterize that as a um, detrimental effect, uh, e you know, uh, ecologically speaking. The, the other part of this I want to point out is the, the energy cost of, uh, you know, of the food that is produced um, in, in industrial um, uh, economies, industrial consumer economies. There's, a, there's an article I remember seeing, and this is probably going back five years. Um, it had been written by a guy named uh, Dr. Eric Garza, and it was called The Energy Cost of Food. I'm trying to find the, 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 the piece right now. 
And basically what he had, um, what he had found, you know, until I find out, I just end up talking like this. What he had found was that for every calorie of food that's produced in the industrialized world, um, it, that it took somewhere in the area of 15 to 20 calories of energy to provide that one calorie of food. So that would include the actual, um, cult, the actual cultivation and the, and the growing and the harvesting of that crop, the processing of the crop, the packaging of the crop, the storage, right? The, the, you know, the, the transportation and the, and the actual, um, you know, provisioning of that crop in, in some sort of uh, retail uh, uh, outlet. And I don't even think they actually included the, the, um, the disposal, right? The energy involved in the, in the disposal of whatever comes from the consumption of that product. Like there's the problem is that instead of existing in the world as a producer and as being responsible for whatever it is that we consume, we exist in the world as consumers. And until we produce the things we consume, then this is going to continue to be a problem. So this red herring as to whether or not, you know, we're meat eaters is it, it completely skirts the issue as to whether or not we are actually responsible for what it is that we live. I mean, what it is that we use in the course of our living and, and existing in the world. Right. Uh, now, obviously, you know, there's the whole idea, you know, there's the whole problem of, you know, uh, feed lots and, you know, confined animal feeding operations and all those things. I mean, that's a no brainer. Of course, that stuff is, is awful. But, um, but it, you know, it, it, this, there's still this issue of, of, um, you know, of, of consuming food that we don't produce. The one, you know, just one last reference here. This, and this is particularly important for, uh, say, the folks that live in California. This is particularly relevant. So I, I just, I, this, this article just happened to pop up. Here, you see it. You see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah. Yes, yeah. Right. So this California couple uses more water than all of the homes in Los Angeles. So these these people that the um, what's their name? The the Resnicks. Mm. Um, yeah, the Resnicks. They've amassed uh, America's second law largest produce company, which is worth an estimated $4.2 billion. They own millions of acres of land in California. Right. And in the irrigation of that land, and this covers everything from, you know, tree crops to vegetables, um, they use a massive amount of water. Now, the, the methods that are used to produce those foods I mean, we, we need to be able to investigate, you know, we, we need to be able to sit down and, you know, find out the particulars of that. But the, the fact that it's, it's using as much, uh, as many resources in the production of that food, that, that's the issue that we got we to gotta sort out. So it's, you know, it's the method of production. It's the, it's the proximity that, that the, that, Though that the the produce is being provided, whether or not you are in fact involved in the provisioning of what you consume, and until we are until we become more responsible for those things, and it's closer to us, right? We're going to continue to have this problem of you know the the, the destruction um, involved in provisioning our lives. Right. Yeah. That's, we keep hearing that. You know, get it in your as close as you can to your backyard. Um, while we have Judith here, uh, we got a few more minutes, but if it's okay with you two, maybe we go a couple minutes over. If anybody has to leave, that's great, but just maybe a few more minutes. But something that, uh, that I've been looking into recently, I'd love to hear, I know Judith's thoughts on it. I've actually been curious about your take on it. Um, and I think it might tie in some elements of Angela's question with wildlife and food and, and meat eating and regenerative landscapes, ecosystem restoration. Um, I know you mentioned Ramis, this idea of this dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River, you know, most of that was the Great Plains, you know, and we were dealing with anywhere from 30 to 60 million bison, depending on who you're talking to. Um, 
and I know Savory's getting into the the, uh, the bison thing. I know I interviewed this wild idea buffalo ranch that Patagonia is working with, and you know they're doing a lot to kind of let the buffalo do their thing. And it's such a complex, interesting issue, but it seems to encompass a lot of these ideas of wildlife, how we feed ourselves, how we restore land. Judith, do you have something you could share about your thoughts on on bison in this? Because I know it's it adds other layers to the whole issue of ruminants on land and things. Uh, what, what what can you share about that initially? Yeah, um, I mean, ecologically, culturally, um, it's a it's a great idea. From what I understand, I that bison are harder to manage than cattle, um, but yeah it it certainly it certainly makes sense you know you're talking about the great plains and all the chemicals that are coming from all our agricultural landscapes i was just in kansas for a week and wow um just all these things that has been talking about we have these lands that are becoming biological deserts and then they also become population deserts too so everything's out of whack as 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 the production of our food becomes increasingly consolidated and connected to all of this is just you know we haven't really talked about this but um or often in these circles we don't talk about this but because i was in kansas it was like right in my face about the ag chemicals which are really doing so much damage to human populations to to plants to soils to biodiversity and that was just mind-blowing to see the impacts of that um, outside of Kansas City every other new building is a hospital or cancer center I mean it's insane I met people that are having horrible health problems that have been in the industry so these are all overlapping um, I guess I've thrown out a lot of ideas but it just to Oh, another thing that um, someone who was there talked about, and this is also relevant, okay, Kansas, we think about, you know, people there think that it's their job, you know, that they carry the mantle of feeding the world, but they import 90% of their food. So it's creating healthy ecosystems that provide livelihoods for people and to give people the opportunity, people were at this event where I was, were flabbergasted to hear that. Um, and there was a real desire to bring more food production home and not have the system that we have now where people are growing in, in an ag industrially intensive way with lots of chemicals to grow grains that are then sent over to China to be packaged and brought back over here as food. Right. Anyway, it's, it's, not, it's not working and it's not providing many people with a meaningful livelihood because farmers are getting paid like six cents on the dollar for these um, commodity crops. And um, yeah, there's got to be a better, a better way. Right. Well, thanks so much, Judith. I really appreciate it. It's been a treat, to, a surprise treat to have you on here. Uh, maybe another time we'll get a chance to have an a interview proper with you two, or, or I will with Musicology or something. But it's really, thanks for uh, being a sport right. and coming on at the last minute. Sounds like a, a plan. Okay, great. Oh, cool. actually, 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 Tim, I, there was something that I wanted to follow up on what, yeah. what Judith was saying. I yeah, think she, you know, there's you. some yeah. really great points that she, that she brought up. So, so um, the, you know, the point about the, and I just put up the graphic um, before with the, the map. I don't know if you guys saw that um, right here. That's, that's the map I was trying to find. And basically, yeah. this is, um, this is a, a mapping the, uh, say, cities um, in relation to all of the, the, the farms, the agricultural uh, areas, again, mostly in the center of the U.S., um, and then you, and then there's actually another map that shows the 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 all of the tributaries, the the you know the rivers, the streams that eventually lead to say the Mississippi, and then that lets out into uh, the Gulf of Mexico, and then the the size of the dead zone that is produced from all of those chemicals um, running into the uh, into into the Gulf. And I think one of the things we have to re we have to understand is um, still. 
the, the degree to which um, uh, energy is a is a critical part of um, of of this whole regime. So, <clears throat> you know, so for example, if we if we talk about where the, what what provides the basis for the production of the chemicals, I mean, most of like the most of the fertilizers, for example, uh, come from natural gas. And then, of course, all the petrochemicals are some derivative of, of petroleum. Um, and then you have to remember that all of those products, those formulations, are somebody's intellectual property. So people make money. You can cause them to become dependent on those products in, in producing something as critically essential as food. So you could also see that in relation to the types of foods that are now relied upon. So, you know, I mean, this is the whole debate, of course, with GMOs. GMOs, somebody owns that stuff. Somebody owns the organism, which means that in order for you to use it, you know, someone has to pay a fee, you know, in terms of, to get, you know, a license to utilize that product. Um, I think in terms of the, you know, what Judith was saying about the, the issue of, you know, illnesses that are coming from the use of a lot of these chemicals, um, one, one, there's one gentleman in particular that um, uh, I've really, you know, benefit, benefited from being able to, to hear from, a guy named Dr. Tyrone Hayes, um, who is a researcher at UC Berkeley. He, he, he had done research in... Um, a widely used on a widely used uh, herbicide called atrazine, which is sort of similar to um, glyphosate, you know, what you would use like Roundup, and it's often used in the cultivation of corn. And one of the things that he found research, um, which he was doing um, at the behest of uh, originally uh, Syngenta, Syngenta, was um, he found that uh, in his in his research, he had been experimenting with frogs, a particular African frog, to see the effects of exposure to what, what are really micro doses of atrazine and, and what it did to the frogs. Um, what he found was is that, that the, the chemicals basically acted as a, um, as a, as a powerful endocrine, endocrine disruptor, basically like a phytoestrogen. Um, Pseudo, I'm sorry, pseudoestrogen, phytoestrogen, pseudoestrogen, um, to where he had the males in his research cohort start to develop eggs in their testicular tubes. Wow. Eventually, those males ended up being able to produce offspring. So he has male frogs that are grandmothers. <laughs> Right. So this that and and one of the one of the problems and Judith probably saw this and this is mentioned by a number of, of, of researchers. One of them in particular is a guy named Don Huber. Is you have a serious problem with fertility in many places in, in areas that have very heavy agricultural production. In addition to the cancers. I mean, that was another thing that he that that Dr. Hayes found was that there was a direct connection. Um, I think of the 13 most common cancers in the United States, 12 of them were directly tied to the use of atrazine or exposure to atrazine. Now here's, now here's the moral hazard with that information that exists. Syngenta is, a, I think, a subsidiary of the company Novartis. Novartis produces um, medications that are used in... Uh, combating the cancers that are connected to the use of atrazine. Oh wow! So, yeah. so that's a problem. So, you know, you, you as far as the company is concerned, this is a situation that is actually advantageous for them because although they make a product that reduces the illness, they also make a product that is used to treat the illness. That their product causes, and you can and you can see that repeated um, along a 
a pretty broad spectrum of other products, but you have very similar outcomes. Right. Insulin, and, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it fine. The, the insulin is probably created by the same companies that um, are producing yeah. the products that are creating. <laughs> diabetes yeah without, you know, without, so, without naming it you know, yeah, it, it uh, yeah i looked at my friend's label and it's we've all heard the name but yeah 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 i'm not gonna i won't do that to you tim <laughs> so anyway okay. but i mean yeah i mean so but i mean but this is but this is the issue and this and i think this goes back to what um to the point that james scott was making in his book you know about the about about civilization well, not civil. Uh, yeah, that that the that the the creation of of the state, of of a of a polity, you know, in in human history has been on the backs of agriculture, and agriculture is made possible through the domestication of again those four elements. Again, it could, I I think you'd extend it to five: people, plants, fire, and animals, and water. Right. So if you have access to those things and you have the ability to control those things, then you've got, you know, you've got a, you, you wield a great deal of power and influence and um, wealth building capability. And then that could be parlayed into, you know, political power, economic power, um, social uh, power and influence. And so, um, you know, the, the ecology is no longer. Uh, you know, necessarily of particular importance because your ability to find other ways to produce and maintain your hold on wealth is no longer solely resting in land and people. Right. You know, it's like they're in other things. It be so. So the so even in in the, being able to produce again the commodities, the the commodified crops are 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 of value such that they they become a proxy for for something else they're a proxy for your ability to, to get access right. to financial wealth right well, so there's a so embedded embedded in all of this stuff is a whole conversation about you know you know yeah capital and 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 you know and and w the different forms of capital and how that's you know parlayed into other you know into oh, other things power to the ecosystem right that's what we're working on yeah <laughs> there you go so we we get we we could keep going. This is awesome. I love chatting with you guys, but we've we've uh, a little bit over time, and uh, I want to let everybody know that next month we have Patrick Verms from the World Agroforestry Center with us, and that's going to be amazing. Also, we're going to be uh, talking about agroforestry, and I think he wants to address also intelligent and natural systems too. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun. Hope to see y'all back, and uh, maybe you too, and chime in on the Q&A or whatever, and uh, let's have some more fun. Thank you both so much. Is there any quick little closing that either one of you wants to share? We're good. All right. Well, um, so, yeah. oh, just to, just to let uh, everybody know, um, uh, the, the ERC's got a, uh, uh, a PDC, a Permaculture Design Certification course. It's the first, it's the first course offering being made. Um, that's coming up in uh, mid June. That'll be happening in Spain, in um, in southern Spain. Uh, that's going to be from June seventeenth to twenty eighth. Uh, I'm also teaching a course next uh, later this month in California at uh, Zaytuna College in the Bay Area from uh, May twenty first to June first. Um, and then I think just in general, you know, for those who aren't already involved with um erc you know please jump in the pool you know it's fun and um you know tell tell a friend yeah and be, um yeah yeah i was gonna say there'll be a link uh after you see our faces you'll see your screen and it'll have a link on the bottom you go to that address ecosystem restoration camps.org and you can become a supporting member that'll enable you to be one of these attendees that gets to ask questions and stuff and then of course this will be up on youtube for everybody afterwards um, one more thing when you mentioned the the course it reminded me there's new a new website up for the regeneration festival happening at the camp and mm. so that's something to check out too i know we'll be doing speaking of the restoration plan some 
plantings in like three different zones there. There'll be music and workshops. So that'll be kind of fun coming up in late September. Um, just another thing I remember I wanted to mention. Um, but yeah. Excellent. Very good. Well, thanks uh, so much. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. You me? Were, yeah, you. you oh, no, I was, no, I was, no. I was just saying, I was, I was, I was <laughs> wanting to thank everybody. I just want to thank everybody for, um, you know, for taking the time uh, to, you know, to participate in this. And um, hopefully we'll, we'll have a chance to see some of you in the not too distant future. Yes. And we'll keep diving deep. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it, man. Have a great day. Thanks, Judith. Thanks, Ramiz. Thanks, right. everybody. Bye. Take care, guys. Cheers.